S.E.P. Fanfic Readings presents Aurelian by Biddy Blue Eyes. Chapter 29 Masculine Mood Swings. At the sound of a fireplace chime, Hermione looked up from her newspaper. Good morning, she said with a smile as Draco stepped out of the green flames and into the kitchen of Grimmauld Place. Good morn. Thank goodness. You almost missed me. What took you so long? Harry interrupted. I only got your message an hour ago. Draco stared at Harry, looking affronted. Harry didn't seem to notice as he stared at his reflection in a large, shiny pot that hung over the kitchen counter. He dipped his comb into a glass of water and tried fruitlessly to tame his wiry hair. Giving up, he tossed the comb grumpily onto the kitchen table. "'Yes, but I thought you'd be ready,' Harry told him irritably. "'Sorry, Potter, but I don't sit by my fireplace waiting for you to call,' Draco scowled. "'Don't mind him, Draco. He's in a foul mood,' Hermione told him. "'Very grumpy,' Aurelian agreed." Draco looked around for the small boy and found him under the table with a plate of grapes. Draco looked at Hermione in question. "'He's pretending he's a troll in the dark forest,' she explained in a whisper. "'I'm not grumpy,' Harry argued. "'I'm just in a rush, and I've been waiting for you to show up.' "'You didn't have to wait, Harry. I could have talked to him,' Hermione said, repeating what she had told him several times in the last hour. "'Yes, but I wanted to ask him myself,' Harry insisted. "'Ask me what?' Draco asked. And what are you dressed up for anyway? I have to be at Dennis Creevy's hearing today, which means that I have to make this quick, Harry said, checking his watch again. We were reading the paper this morning, Muggle and Wizard, and we found some things that interested us. Specifically, we saw that Bartholomew Burke passed away. Yeah, I saw that too, said Draco, eyeing Harry curiously. He's related to you, isn't he? Harry asked. Was, yes, Draco answered. How did you know that? Hermione looked it up in one of the many genealogy books around here, Harry answered offhandedly. I don't know about you, but we found it awfully suspicious that they kept his death as a secret. The family says that he died of natural causes a week ago. He was never seen by a healer, nor examined by a mortician. It is, as you know, part of the law that bodies must be examined by a registered healer or mortician before being prepared for burial or cremation. The family privately buried him the morning after his death without reporting the death to anyone at all. A legal battle has now started over whether the body should be exhumed and examined or left to rest. Yeah, I saw that, said Draco. So what is it you're getting at? Well, we're wondering if there's more to it. Are they hiding something? We're looking for the possible use of a killing curse by Bellatrix to make a new Horcrux. I want to know if this could be it. As your family, I was wondering if you might be able to find out more about it. They'd only get defensive with me or any other official. But you, are you close enough to them to... I see what you're getting at, and yes, I think I can talk to them. He was the husband of my great-aunt on my father's side. My mother had mentioned that we should send them something. I'll just pop in with a gift basket or flowers or something, Draco agreed. You want me to take care of that today, then, I'm assuming? Yes, that and the guy from Prodigy's Cauldrons owled. He said that he found that information about when he sold that large cauldron, and he thinks he remembers the guy a bit. He said that he's busy today, but he should have some time around noon if one of us could swing in. I'm desperately hoping that this court thing won't take that long, but I can't count on it. And damn, I'm going to be late if I don't get moving. Harry groaned as he twisted the watch on his wrist. I've got it, Potter. Now stop whining and get out of here, Draco said. Thanks, Harry said quickly. If not sooner, I'll see you guys tonight. Without a pause, Harry grabbed a pinch of flu powder and disappeared in the fireplace. You weren't kidding when you said he was in a foul mood, Draco commented. He gets like that every time he's required to attend court proceedings. This case is rather hard on him, too, explained Hermione. He didn't have to wait for me. I know, but he doesn't like to ask favors of people. He hates passing requests through others even more. On top of that, I think he was a little worried about how you'd take his desire to investigate your family. He didn't want you to take it the wrong way, she explained. I'm just as concerned as he is. Mother and I were discussing it this morning, he replied. But what did he mean when he said he'd see us tonight? Does he have something else planned? Well, sort of. Molly asked us to invite you to dinner at the borough tonight. Draco's eyes widened and Hermione had to suppress a giggle. You're under no obligation to accept. Harry just assumed you would. Fred and George have been working almost nonstop on producing new shield cloaks, made of silk, for the entire family. They're making them for you, me, Harry, and Aurelian as well. They've asked everyone to meet at the borough to be fitted for them. Molly invited everyone to dinner. If you'd rather not, I'm sure the twins wouldn't mind if you went to the shop to get fitted tomorrow or something. Um, no, that's fine. I can attend dinner, Draco said uncomfortably. I'm sorry. I know it's awkward, Hermione said sympathetically. It's just one uncomfortable meeting after the next. 
Speaking of, Draco stopped speaking as his and Hermione's attention was stolen away by the movement of a red grape that rolled out from under the table. They heard Aurelian make a growling roar before his hand darted out and swiped the grape back into his lair. Remember, those grapes are for eating, she reminded him. Trolls no eat grapes. Eat rabbits. Num 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 num. Aurelian growled again as he viciously consumed his runaway grape. My mistake, but make sure you don't make a mess of those rabbits, okay, Mr. Troll? She smiled. I'm sorry, you were saying? She asked, returning her attention to Draco as he sat down in the kitchen chair across from her. You were talking about one uncomfortable meeting after the next, and, well, I had something I had wanted to ask you, he said, looking uncertain about how to proceed. The way he approached the subject made Hermione decidedly anxious. I told you before that I am obligated to attend formal banquets with my mother. It happens that I am required to attend one Wednesday evening, and, as always, it is expected that I should bring a date. I was wondering if you would like to accompany me. Draco forced himself to remain calm, but as soon as he finished, he felt like kicking himself for his delivery. He had no difficulty inviting women to join him in the past, but with Hermione it was different somehow. He actually desired her company, and felt cruel inviting her to an event that he really didn't want to attend at all. In the end, he didn't make it seem like something she would want to say yes to. "'A banquet?' Hermione asked, nervous butterflies erupting in her belly. He was asking her for a formal date. Even those terms didn't seem to do the invitation justice. Draco Malfoy was an aristocratic socialite that dined with the richest, most famous, and powerful people in wizard society. Because of his wealth, his long, pure bloodline, and all of the personal connections he had made in the social arena throughout his life, he was quite a prominent person. He was part of a strange upper society that she really didn't understand. She herself had been to a few formal banquets in the past couple years because of her involvement in the war. She, Ron, and Harry were actually guests of honor at a state dinner where they were presented with their Order of Merlin First Class Awards. It felt so funny to her, though. She was honored to be in the group, but just didn't feel like she fit in with some of the others there. Draco had been raised in the group. The idea, though it made her a little anxious, was exciting. Draco was inviting her on a formal date. They would be revealed as a couple to the public. It felt like a declaration. Her feeling of girlish giddiness plummeted when she imagined the photos that would be taken of them, and possible stories in the Daily Prophet and Witch Weekly. Both she and Draco were too well known for it to be overlooked. And then there was Draco's mother, who would be in attendance as well. Hermione wasn't looking forward to another dinner with Narcissa Malfoy any time soon. When your mother insisted you bring a date, I'm pretty sure I'm not what she had in mind, Hermione stated hesitantly. I talked to my mother this morning. She was already under the assumption that I would be inviting you. Draco told her. And, Hermione prodded, and she accepts that, he said. She didn't like the way I pressed the issue further, but I did. She has assured me, in her own way, that she will be on her best behavior. Hermione nodded slowly, lost in her own thoughts. It's an invitation, Hermione, not an obligation. If you prefer not to go... What? No, she said, shaking away her private thoughts. I'd love to join you. I'm honored that you'd invite me. Draco eyed her skeptically. Really? If you don't feel comfortable with it, that's all right. I'd understand. No, really. I'd love to spend the evening with you. I just get a little nervous about big social gatherings sometimes. At Draco's expression, she hurried to continue in her reassurances. I really would love to join you. It sounds nice, actually. And besides, I can be a rather jealous person at times. I don't think I'd be able to survive the thought of you going with someone else if I were to decline. She wore a playful, smug little grin. But a small blush still rose on her cheeks. No, if that's the reason you want to accept, then don't. I don't want you to feel pressured. I... Draco, please, Hermione pleaded. I accept, and I'm not because of that. I was teasing when I said that. I mean, it's true that I would be jealous, but I really would like to go with you. Honestly, truly, I would. You don't need to be jealous, Draco said seriously. If you were to decline, I was just going to ask Pansy. I have no intention of pursuing other girls while I'm seeing you. Hermione felt her heart swell with relief and gratitude, but she kept the mood light. You act like that would keep me from feeling jealous. What? Draco said in surprise. You'd still be jealous if I took Pansy? Hermione. Pansy's just a friend. It'd be like taking an extra talkative, shoe-obsessed blaze. I... I understand that, Hermione interrupted. But she's still a girl, and on top of that, you dated her in our sixth year. I hardly call that dating, he protested. And... And how would you feel if the roles were reversed and I took Ron or Harry? Hermione challenged. Draco's expression changed instantly, a fire roaring to life in his eyes, and Hermione chuckled. Exactly. I'm not saying my jealousy is rational. 
but you'd obviously feel the same way. I see your point, but I think that there's something we're going to have to work on then. I don't want you to ever feel jealous or have doubts when you're not around, he solemnly replied. I'll admit that I have my faults, but I am a faithful person. I swear to you that I won't even consider another woman while I'm with you. The butterflies in Hermione's stomach began fluttering madly. I'm a faithful person too, Draco. I don't want you to ever worry about that, especially with Ron or Harry. They're like my brothers. Draco nodded. Now that that's settled, jealousy aside, do you really want to go? A warm smile broke over Hermione's face and she reached across the table to take his hand. Really, I would. I think it would be a great time. You have me curious now, though. What? Hermione's speech was cut off by the chime over the fireplace. She and Draco looked up curiously. Merlin, if Harry... Hermione stopped again as Ginny stepped out of the fireplace garb in her Quidditch uniform. Ginny? Draco said in surprise. Uh, hi, she said uncomfortably as she looked at Hermione and Draco's clasped hands atop the table. Noticing Ginny's object of focus, Hermione quickly withdrew her hand and looked away bashfully. Uh, hi, um, sorry, but Harry's not here, she said. Oh, I know, I came to talk to you. I, well, I feel bad having to tell you, but Mum's not going to be able to watch Ari today. Oh, Hermione replied. It was a potential problem as she knew that herself she would not be able to watch him because of a prior commitment she made to her mother. Draco, too, was busy. She looked under the table and was startled to see nothing but an empty plate. Ari? Ari, where are you? It was her first reaction to panic, and though she knew he had not left the room, she immediately looked to the still-closed kitchen door. What, mummy? Aurelian asked. His tiny head and shoulders appeared over the top of a large cauldron in the back corner of the room. What are you doing there? Hermione asked. Her panic washed away. She looked quite puzzled. Poyen, Aurelian answered. Hermione nodded slowly, and Aurelian disappeared back into the cauldron. Uh, right. What was I saying? Ginny asked. Oh, yeah. Mum went to check on Aunt Muriel, and it seems that this time she's not faking it. She's come down with dragonpox, and Mum had to take her to St. Mungo's. She would take Ari with her, but she wouldn't want him to be exposed to it, Ginny explained. Heavens, no. Is Aunt Muriel going to be okay, though? Hermione asked with concern. I'm sure she will be. It's quite treatable now. You never know, though. Aunt Muriel's been convinced for the last seven or eight months that she's too old and this will be her the year she dies. She's too ornery to conk out, if you ask me. Annoying people will always stick around too long, Ginny rambled. Draco chuckled at this, but quickly dropped his smile when he realized that she was actually serious. Anyway, Mum's not going to be able to watch him, and unfortunately neither am I. I have practice today. I was able to take him last time, but this practice is going to be pretty intense, as it's one of the last ones before our game against Puddlemere. I just won't be able to keep a good eye on him. You know I would if I could, she said ardently. I know you would, Ginny. It's okay. I understand. Hermione assured her. Although she did understand, she was starting to worry about what to do with Ari for the day. I know you're in quite a spot today, so I asked around for you, but I really can't find anyone. Dad, Bill, Fleur, Charlie, and Ron are all working. I tried Fred and George, because normally they wouldn't mind having him at the store, but they're also working on those shield cloaks. I even tried Percy. I, I really don't know what to say, Ginny said miserably. It's okay, Hermione repeated, becoming increasingly worried. Is it? Do you have someone else in mind? Ginny pressed. Well, no, not yet, Hermione answered quietly. My dad is at work, and I have to meet with my mom at the bank. I can't bring him with us to that meeting. This is just too important to her. She needs me. This business loan thereafter could make or break their practice. She can't do it without me. I... Hermione sighed as she considered who else might be able to watch her son. She'd never found herself in a position like it before. Well, what time is the meeting? Couldn't I watch him until you're done? Draco offered. You have things to do also, remember? Hermione told him. That meeting with the man at Pottages is important, and so is what we might possibly learn from the Burks. It's okay, though. I'm sure we can find someone. I'm really sorry, Hermione, Ginny said earnestly. I really do have to get going, though. I know, really, it's fine. We'll figure it out, Hermione assured her. You know, it may not be your first choice, but I bet Luna would watch him. I think she's free today, Ginny recommended. Thanks. You better get going, though, Hermione suggested. Ginny had been backing up toward the fireplace as she'd spoken. It was obvious that she needed to go, but she felt miserable leaving her friend in such a position. All right. Well, I'll see you tonight, right? Hermione nodded in response, afraid that if she kept answering, Ginny might find the need to keep responding also. See you later, Ori, Ginny called. Bye! Aurelian's head popped out of the cauldron right back in. Ginny gave a final wave and stepped into the fireplace. So, what are you thinking? Draco asked. I don't know, Hermione said, worrying her bottom lip. I've never been in this position before. 
I can think of a few people, but I can't ask just anyone. They'll want to know who he is, and I can't really explain that right now. I mean, Luna would be okay, but I don't know. Hermione, Draco said tentatively. What about my mother? What? Hermione asked in shock. I know you don't have the best impression of her, and that is her fault, he added. But she'd watch him. She doesn't work, and she doesn't have any plans today. At Hermione's silence, he continued. She would be good to him. She was telling me just this morning that she'd like to see him again. I... I don't know, Hermione replied, nervously considering the option. She would be good to him, I promise. And she wouldn't dare speak badly of you or any of your friends in front of him, Draco assured her. I know it might not be easy for you to believe, but she's always been a good mother to me, and she'd really like to be a good grandmother, too. I, I don't doubt that, but I, I really don't know her. I'm afraid to trust her with... Hermione's speech drifted off with her thoughts. I understand, Draco told her. I won't be offended if you say no. You don't know her, and it's hard to trust her with something as important as the care of your son. But if you're not sure if you can trust her, do you think you can just trust my judgment? Hermione stopped and looked up at him, her eyes meeting his. The boy, who was once so closed off, looked at her with mild candor and asked her to trust him. Her eyes held him as she nodded slowly. Yes, I trust you. If you trust her, then so do I. Draco smiled warmly in response. Though he'd said he would not be offended if she decided against it, it still meant a lot to him that she could trust him in that way. All right, I'll go speak with my mother now, then to make sure it's all right. Perhaps you can gather some toys for him. Okay. Aurelian, come on out. We have to get you ready. You get to go and see your grandmother again, Hermione said, trying to sound cheerful. Yay! Aurelian cried, his voice echoing in the cauldron. His head popped up again, and he quickly scurried from his hiding place. Hermione kicked off her heels as she made her way into the living room. She then dropped her blazer and purse onto the coffee table and fell lazily into her sofa. Her aching feet pointed and flexed, happy to be free of their uncomfortable confines. Closing her eyes, she smiled and sighed contentedly. The meeting had lasted longer than she had expected, and she was pleased it was over. She was glad that she was able to be there for her mother, but it certainly wasn't an atmosphere she enjoyed. The execution wasn't that hard, as Hermione had run the numbers and planned every detail weeks in advance. That was the reason her parents had asked for her help in acquiring the business loan in the first place. She had a real talent with both numbers and presentation. No, the difficult part of it was the attitudes of all involved. The bank officials reviewing the loan held an air of aloof skepticism the entire time, asking many detailed questions that were of little or no consequence. Her mother, though usually quite composed, was a nervous wreck and couldn't seem to keep her voice steady. Luckily, Hermione was not intimidated and was able to make an almost flawless presentation— her work had paid off, and her parents' loan was approved. Hermione's smile grew. The entire ordeal created a strange feeling inside. It had been stressful, but enjoyable at the same time. It was nice to have a stressful event that had a finite end. A tense situation that had nothing to do with new motherhood, relationships, or saving the world. For a few hours, she was a normal human being. She sighed again in a moment of pure content. The moment passed quicker than she would have liked or expected— the image of a familiar lopsided smile surfaced in her mind, and she felt a small tug at her heart. It answered the question she hadn't meant to ask. What could make this moment better? That was her answer. Draco. He had been coming to her mind a lot the last few weeks. Every time she found a moment alone, his face was the first thing that came to mind. It started out as just thinking of him, and who he was, and what they were doing as a group. But it seemed that over the last week she found herself wishing for his company. Though no one else knew of these feelings, Hermione was a little embarrassed by them. She felt rather childish, consumed by puppy love or something of the like. Certainly she was falling for him, and that didn't mean she had to be desiring his company around the clock. A tiny voice inside wondered if he was feeling the same way. But she quashed it, insisting that she would not allow herself to be consumed by foolish lovesick thoughts. She was startled from her thoughts by a knock at the door. It was a moment before she sat up and made her way over to it as her mind was fishing around for possible visitors. When she opened the door, a great smile broke over her face. Draco! Her heart fluttered when she saw his face light up. The feelings delayed her logic momentarily, but not for long. Where's Ari? He's still with my mother. I made sure that she knew you were insistent about him taking a nap on time. So when I finished up and headed home to check on them, she shooed me away, saying I was not to interfere with the nap that I was so fiercely ordered. Draco chuckled. She asked if she could hold on to him until three o'clock. That way they can have a little snack when he gets up. I told her that I thought it would be okay. 
is it? And uh, since I didn't have anything else to do right now, I thought I'd see if you were here. I hope that's all right also. It had all sounded like a good plan when he was leaving the manor, but standing on Hermione's doorstep, he realized that he had resumed quite a bit. No, that's fine on both accounts. Please come in. I'm sorry for holding conversation with you on the street, she blushed as he entered. So how did it go? he asked. What? Oh, right, it went fine. My parents got the loan, Hermione said proudly. You, though, how did it go with you? Her smile faded and the concerned wrinkle in her brow returned. It was back to motherhood, relationships, and saving the world. Um, well... Draco stopped and tried to think of where best to start. His day had already been quite busy. I'm sorry, please forgive me, Hermione apologized. She easily slipped her hand into his and guided him with her. Let's sit. Draco allowed her to lead him to the sofa and sat behind her. She moved to extract her hand from his, but he gave it a small squeeze and rested his hand with hers on his leg. Well, I visited the Burke family, and it's not what we were thinking. I could tell by the way they talked that there was nothing that they were hiding about his death. He simply died of old age. The reasons behind all the secrecy were just family disputes. What do you mean? Hermione asked. Well, as you know, Bartholomew Burke was my great-uncle by marriage. His wife, Sophia Burke, née Malfoy, is the sister of my father's father, Abraxas Malfoy. I guess my great-aunt Sophia has known for a few months now that her husband was dying. The reason she and their children buried him so quickly after is because of a dispute with the Burke family, specifically Bartholomew's sister, Almeida. She wanted him buried in the Burke family cemetery, while Zelfia insisted that he be buried in the Malfoy family cemetery, Draco explained. Isn't it customary for a man to be buried in his own family cemetery? I mean, a woman could be buried with her husband's family and her birth family, but aren't men always buried with their families? In pure-blood wizard traditions, at least. Yes, it's certainly customary, but things are rarely as simple as they should be. Great-uncle Bartholomew was rather estranged from his family. He was not disowned, but rather close, too. I'd rather not go into details right now, he added quickly, seeing Hermione's interest. The drama and nonsense could take days to explain. In short, Sophia wanted him buried at the Malfoys and had him buried there quickly and quietly so that Almeida wouldn't get in the way. Almeida can pitch a fit all she wants, but it's illegal to exhume a body without proper cause that is authorized by the court. Well, you're right. That certainly doesn't sound like someone's trying to cover a murder, Hermione agreed. What a headache, though. I feel rather sorry for Zofia. Do you? Draco asked curiously. Why? Well, that was her husband. Customary or not, it should be left up to the spouse to decide what is done to the remains. If Bartholomew trusted her enough to marry her and share their lives together— then I'm sure he would want her to do what felt right to her when it came to his remains. I mean, when a man marries, he leaves his father and mother and unites with his wife. A tie to a spouse far outweighs the tie to one's family, with the exception of children, because the relationship is bound with promise and commitment. And I'm going on and on again, aren't I? Hermione ended with embarrassment. Please don't let me rant like that. I tend to get up on my soapbox without ever meaning to. No, you're very opinionated. I rather like it, Drake amused. You won't if we're ever of opposed beliefs, she told him with a grimace. Anyway, what about the man at Pottage's cauldron shop? The cauldron was purchased a few days before Creevy visited the graveyard. The date isn't really all that important anymore, though. We already have an approximate date on when she returned. He remembers what the customer looked like. It wasn't either of my uncles, but I know who it is, Draco said with a look of defeat. He said the man had been shaggy, frazzled hair that was on the border of dark blonde, or a very light brown and he had a long scar over the right side of his face. It's Summers. Summers? But that means... That means they're already recruiting, Draco finished when her voice faded away from her thoughts. It means that they're recruiting before Bellatrix was even back, Hermione corrected. That's... That's... That's enough, Draco told her. Don't overthink it right now. Potter's going to want to hear it, and it will send us into a long circular conversation then. Let's put it aside till later. Can we do that? Hermione looked at him, her brows scrunched with worry and frustration. She closed her eyes and let it slip away the best she could. Draco was right. She had been so glad to get a break from it all for a few minutes. She'd wished for time with him, and she had it. With a life as crazy as theirs, she needed to compartmentalize. It was time to relax. She opened her eyes to the lopsided smile that she had been thinking about earlier, and everything else melted away. So, she said, why don't you tell me about this banquet that you're so dreading? Is it another charity ball of some sort? Well, first, he smiled, I'm not dreading it nearly as much now that I get to spend the evening with you. And no, it's not a charity ball. 
It's a banquet hosted by St. Mungo's in honor of my cousin. Your cousin? Hermione asked in confusion. She had never heard of him mention a cousin before. The only cousin she had known about was Tonks. On my father's side, Draco offered. Your father's side? I didn't know. I had always assumed your father was... Wait, I was just looking at your family tree this morning. Well, part of it, anyway. I remember now that there was another name. I didn't pay much mind. I had just always assumed that your father was an only child. It didn't register to me that he had a... Sister, Draco finished. Yeah, my cousin is through her. It feels so strange that I never knew. Your family is so well known. I feel that I should have known that you had a cousin. Yeah, well, we're not very close, in age or relationship. My aunt is quite a bit older than my father. My cousin is only six years younger than my father. So she always felt more like an aunt than a cousin, Draco explained. Anyway, the banquet is to honor her for the latest developments in healing magic. She's been working for the past several years on therapy to help restore brain function to those who have suffered brain damage, either from physical or natural causes. Only a month ago, she submitted her completed research to the board, a combination of potions and charms that have proven quite successful. While it's still new and somewhat experimental, it has just been approved as possible treatment options. Draco surveyed Hermione uncertainly. Throughout his explanation, her face had lit up in awe and her mouth hung open. Your, your cousin is Angelica Preston? She exclaimed in shock. Yes, he affirmed, his eyes narrowed in puzzlement. You know her? Well, I know of her, Hermione said, as though everyone should. I read about her work in Popular Potions magazine months ago. I was curious, so I looked into her work. She is incredible. She's helped the magical medical field in so many ways. Do you know she was only 22 years old when she patented a new treatment for dragonpox? She's the reason that dragonpox is so rarely fatal anymore. You know, I should really stop being surprised by your studious habits by now, shouldn't I? Draco asked with a smirk. And yes, I knew that. Dragonpox was the original reason she became a healer. A grandfather, Abraxas Malfoy, died of dragonpox. Wow. I was honored to be attending the banquet with you before, but I'm even more honored now that I know it's for her. It's so exciting. I was just telling Neville about her work last month. With her treatment approved, he's already set up an appointment to have her see his parents, to see if she can help recover their memories as well as general brain function. She's already looked into their files and believes that her treatment will be able to help, at least to some degree, Hermione rambled excitedly. You've certainly made this event something to look forward to now. I never knew you were so interested in the healing arts. I told you before that law enforcement wasn't something I was aspiring towards. During the war, I saw so much suffering, and I felt so ill-equipped to help. I was always fascinated by magical healing. I had seen enough of it in school with as many accidents as my friends and I had. It's something I'm still interested in. It's just not my occupation, she explained. If you didn't feel like law enforcement needed you, would you have become a healer? Draco asked curiously. Well, yeah, probably. I mean, there were many things I considered at the time. But I think healing would have been something I would have enjoyed. I like to have a job where I feel like I'm really doing something meaningful, something that directly affects people, Hermione shrugged. Well, I'm sure Angelica will be pleased to see that I've chosen a date with substance for once. She usually likes to poke fun at my dates. Luckily, they weren't smart enough to realize they were being insulted, Draco chuckled. You've had many dates to such events, Hermione asked uncomfortably. Never the same one, with the exception of Pansy. I made sort of a game of asking random girls, Draco said nonchalantly. Hermione, your jealousy is showing, he teased. Hermione became sheepish when he called it on her. She had looked away from him and had slight bitter pucker of her lips. I assure you, you are much more welcome company. Thank you, she replied, trying to overcome her embarrassment. So what will you be wearing to this engagement? Black dress robes of some flavor, he said with a shrug. Why? Well, I'm going to have to buy some new dress robes, and I just wanted to make sure that I wouldn't clash with you, she answered. You don't need to go buy new dress robes. I'm sure you have something appropriate in your closet. Well, I do, but they're the same robes that I wore to the last two dinners I attended, and it didn't go unnoticed by which weekly then. I'm certainly not going to give them any ammunition again, she snorted in amusement. It will be nice to spoil myself with a new addition to my wardrobe. Well, let me know what color it is then, and I'll try to pick a tie or kerchief to match. Hermione fell quiet as she looked at him with a warm, pleasant, pensive smile. "'You're doing it again, aren't you?' he asked. "'Doing what?' "'Remembering who I am.' "'I never forget who you are,' she replied. "'But I know what you mean. Sometimes it does hit me funny when I think about who we were.' "'I'm sorry,' he said remorsefully. "'No, I don't want apologies,' Hermione said quickly. "'But I need to,' Draco said solemnly. 
I said so many cruel things to you. I wasn't nice to you either, she reminded him. But I attacked you every chance I got, he spoke quietly, an ache of regret settling inside of him. I need you to know that I am sorry for all of it. I don't want you to hurt when you look at me. I don't, she told him, surprised by his assumption. Draco, I think you're mistaken as to how I look back at our past. I don't feel hurt or bitter when I think back to what we were like to one another. In fact, I think you'll be quite surprised to know that I find it all sort of humorous. Humorous, he said incredulously. I insulted you in the worst ways time and time again, and you find that humorous. <laughs> yes, we were so ridiculous. We disliked each other with a passion, and we didn't even know each other. And you claimed to have insulted me in the worst ways, but to be frank, I found your taunts to be rather unimaginative. Draco's eyes widened in disbelief. Hermione smirked and continued. You attacked my hair, my teeth, my birth status, and my know-it-all tendencies. Easy targets. I mean, it upset me then, but now it just seems so silly how I let it get to me. Truthfully, it doesn't hurt at all when you think of how I treated you? Draco persisted. No. Does it hurt you? She asked with a concern. I mean, the way I treated you. No, but you didn't say nearly as much to me. No, but I did slap you, she reminded him. Does that still upset you? Draco snorted a small chuckle. No, I guess I see what you mean. It was humiliating and infuriating at the time, but it's rather amusing when I look back on it now. Good, she smirked, because that's all that's passed between us. I think that's the one thing I will never be able to apologize for. If you're concerned about the things you once said to me, then consider that full retribution. Draco returned her lopsided grin, but he closed his eyes and allowed it to slip away as she gently ran her fingers over his cheek. Imagine what you would have thought then if you could have known that you'd one day be caressing that cheek, he said softly, hoping that she wouldn't pull away. I would not have believed it, she whispered. His eyes still closed. He could feel her moving in before her lips gently pressed to his. So soft and warm against his, he couldn't bear the thought of her pulling away. His hands wrapped around her waist and pulled her body to his. Hermione adjusted herself to straddle his lap and her fingers wove up into his hair. The soft, delicate kiss deepened as they allowed themselves to realize the desires they had been suppressing while so often in the company of others. Each kiss they shared in the presence of others was restrained and always left them with only partial satisfaction. Their private time together, which she had been secretly wishing for, awakened a fierce passion between them. Her mind, overwhelmed by the ferocity of Draco's kiss, allowed her to be guided by the sensations coursing through her. Her hands tugged at his hair and stroked down his neck and chest. She only vaguely registered the feeling of him tugging her shirt free from the waist of her skirt, but strong waves of sensation burned through her from the lightest touch of his fingertips on the smooth skin of her waist. An involuntary moan escaped her as Draco lightly suckled the delicate skin near the base of her throat. Hermione's fingers worked on their own, unconsciously undoing the top buttons of her blouse to expose more skin to his gracious mouth. Draco pulled back to view the new expanse of skin revealed to him, and a haze was lifted at the tops of her breasts, where visible above her powder-blue bra. Stop, he said suddenly, taking hold of her hands and pulling them off of his chest. Hermione was startled by the sudden change, and before she could fully register what was happening, Draco stood up. His action caused her to slide sideways off his lap, and she was forced to throw her arms out in order to catch herself from falling off the sofa. She stared up at him with panic and confusion. I'm sorry, but we have to stop. We can't do this, Draco said, standing in front of her, looking quite panicked himself. Hermione nodded, but her thoughts unwittingly left her lips. Did I do something wrong? What? he asked in shock. No, gods, no, Merlin. You were doing everything right. Despite his words, Hermione self-consciously pulled the top of her blouse closed. It's not you at all, Draco continued. We just, we can't do this. We can't let ourselves go like this. Hermione nodded again. Her eyes began to sting and glisten in her fear and humiliation. Please, no, it's not you. No, it is you. You mean too much to me for me to allow us to rush things like this, he explained earnestly. I understand, she whispered. She could not look at him as there was an ache burning inside of her. Do you? No, you can't, he answered before she had the chance. I like you so much. I like you too much to allow us to continue like that. I wouldn't be able to stop myself if we were to go any further, and we can't. Draco sighed in his frustration and ran a hand through his messy blonde hair. That, Draco gestured a shaking hand toward where they'd sat together a moment before, as he uncomfortably struggled to use the word. Sex. 
it changes things. It changes relationships, and I don't want to take that step and find out that we weren't ready for it. I've never liked anyone the way I like you. No one has ever meant as much as you do, and I don't want to make any mistakes. Hermione nodded again, unsure of how else to respond. Still, Draco saw the uncertainty in her eyes and felt desperate to make her understand. I've never loved anyone before. My mind tells me that it's too soon to feel, too soon to say, but I feel it. I know it. I love you already, and I know I can love you so much more if I have the chance. I don't want to lose that chance by rushing things. Please, please believe me. Please understand, he pleaded. Things are so backward for us. It complicates things. I don't know what to do to fix it. Fix what? she asked finally. I don't know. Our relationship started all wrong. We started with a child and visions of a successful relationship. Whether we like it or not, we have expectations. We want that success and everything feels too perfect because it's all out of order. We're skipping things, he explained. Skipping what? I I don't know, he said, running an anxious hand through his hair again. Fighting, he said, straightening up as he remembered the similar conversation he held with Blaze. Fighting? Hermione blinked in confusion and concern. Yes, arguing. We'd like to think everything is going to be okay, that there's no problems standing in our way, but there are. We're so different. There are things we have to overcome. We, we, Draco left off uncertainly. What is it you think is standing in our way? What is it you're afraid we can't get past? She asked. I don't know. Just things. Things like... Draco fished around for ideas and grasped onto the only solid example he had been able to come up with. I own a house elf. I'm not at all ashamed of it, and I will never dismiss her. He stated so baldly that it came out quite like a challenge. What? Hermione asked in stunned disbelief. You don't like house elves, and I happen to own one. I will not apologize for it, and I will not send her away. It would crush her, he said with a firm resolve. First, I have never said that I don't like house elves. It's quite the opposite. The rallying and protesting that I'm sure you remember were not against house elves, but to promote their welfare and make life better for them, she calmly explained. I admit that I was rather ambitious and naive when I started, hoping to free them when they didn't wish to be freed. To be fair, the only three house elves that I had met were treated very poorly by their masters. I see things a bit differently now, even more so since I've met Perny. I don't believe that there is fault in having a house elf. I don't think badly of you because of it. But at dinner, you didn't like giving Perny orders, Draco said in confusion. I didn't like how confused the poor thing was. Honestly, I was afraid to give her an order. She was confused by the situation, and so was I. And even though I have nothing against those who own house elves, I still don't think I'd be comfortable giving one orders. Yet, at least. And Aurelian, she added, I certainly don't like the way he thought he could just get whatever he wanted through Perny. Draco looked at her skeptically. Draco, I know what Perny is to you, and I'd never ask you to dismiss her, especially because of me. She's like a part of your family. I see how much you care for her and how much you mean to her. You're right that it would crush her if you ever dismissed her, and I would never want that, Hermione said seriously. I understand your concern about us. I have those concerns, too. I've never felt this way about anyone, either, and to know that the relationship I've always longed for is possible with you makes me afraid that I might do something that would screw it up but I don't think things are backward as you think. Yes, things have started out strangely. Our relationship started with a child and a vivid image of what could be, but other than that, we're no different than any other couple. We started with a spark that makes us want to get to know each other better. And what couple, under that circumstance, doesn't dream of a successful, lasting relationship? It's true that our vision is more vivid than others, but that doesn't make us different. Every couple has issues they need to work through, but they can't tackle them all at the beginning. If anything, we have an advantage over all the others. We've seen that what we have is possible. It's happened in an alternate reality. We know that there will be trials that come our way, but if that alternate reality, we were able to make all the necessary compromises, what makes you think we can't do it again? If anything, we should feel confident that we can overcome anything thrown at us. We can't solve our problems before they come, though. You're trying to cross bridges before we even come to them. Bridges over rivers that may not even exist. At this, she smiled warmly, took his hand in hers, and guided them back to the sofa with her. He sat quietly beside her, unable to pry his eyes from hers. We can have something wonderful together. I believe that. In order for that to happen, though, we 
We're just going to have to take things one step at a time. In her speech, she had addressed so much and assuaged so many fears that had been tearing him up. There were so many things he wanted to say in return. He wanted to explain how much that meant to him, to thank her, but the words to do so just didn't seem available to him. I love you were the words that fell from his lips. Draco wasn't sure whether it was he or she that initiated the hug, but the next thing he knew, his arms were wrapped tightly around her waist, while her arms were around his neck, her fingers woven into his hair once more in an emotional embrace. Her face was buried against his neck as he held her. After a few silent moments, he felt a delicate kiss placed just under his jaw, followed by a whispered, I love you too.